Good morning. Uh, welcome to Open Day. My name's Simon Bronnett. Um, I'll um, just hand over to uh, Faris um, um, Salam, uh, who will um, in, in, uh, kick off with housekeeping and uh, a few, few remarks. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Open Day, and specifically to the Sydney Law School Law at Sydney uh, talk. Uh, today, we are, we're joined by Professor, Professor Simon Brunet, the Dean and Head of Sydney Law School, Wendy uh, Hope, President of Sydney University Law Society, and Mr. Peter Finneran, the Head of Strategic Partnerships and Engagement at the Sydney Law School. So, uh, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, matters, you know, so you've got the Q&A functionality uh, at the bottom of the screen. So please post all questions, uh, all your questions in, in that Q&A box, and we will endeavor to answer them. And uh, we also have a, a law course advice Zoom. So if we couldn't get uh, uh, to answer all your questions, please feel free to join us in the course advice uh, room. So now over to you, Professor Simon Brunet. Thank you, Ferris. Um, well, I hope you can uh, see me. Um, I'm, uh, I've just paused the uh, PowerPoint because I just wanted to say hello to everybody um, and um, welcome to Open Day. Um, so my name is Simon. Uh, I'm the Dean, uh, Professor um, um, at uh, uh, Sydney Law School. Um, so today um, what we have a, a few people presenting, um, uh, um, including um, a president of our a student law society. So you hear from students, uh, but also from our professional staff who can uh, address uh, a whole range of uh, questions you may have about studying um, at Sydney. And then there will be a Q&A at the end. So I'm just gonna start sharing um, and um, I hope you'll be able to um, see um uh, uh see the presentation as it un, uh, unfurls um it's uh, i've called it uh, lawyers for the future but interestingly of course it starts in the past because sydney law school is the oldest um law school as i um have put on the first page um hashtag uh, got to be with the program inspiring legal minds since 1890. in fact uh, as you'll see um um uh, with the um powerpoint um um we um um uh, are uh, uh, actually older than that um we were constituted as one of the first um uh, faculties um of the university but look first um it is my uh, honor privilege to acknowledge country um i'm here on gadigal land um on the um uh of the mighty Eora nation um, and uh, if I was uh, physically in the law school, I would also offer a, a, a welcome, uh, not a welcome to country. I'm not indigenous, uh, but an acknowledgement uh, using language, Nyeri Kalawagan, Mari Piri Gadi Nurda, which means we meet together on the very beautiful um, Gadi country. And um, as you can see, uh, if you are not aware, um, uh, the top uh, picture there is, in fact, of a gaddy plant, these amazing uh, uh, indigenous plants that you'll see all across um, the area in which the university is located. And we have some beautiful gardens now, um, indigenous gardens being created in, in and around the law school. Um, also, in very tangible ways, the law school um, and the law school board, which is our formal governing body, has um, was the first school within the university to sign the Uluru Statement of the Heart. And there's a picture of us uh, um, um, uh, with our copy of the statement uh, at that historic um, uh, meeting with staff and students. Um, as I said, you know, the theme is looking forward, uh, but we always start at the, at the beginning and uh, uh, that's right at the foundation of the university. Um, uh, we were the first um, um, university to offer law courses. We weren't the first law school. Um, Melbourne pipped us to the post in establishing a first a, a law school with an LLB curriculum. Uh, however, uh, from 1890, uh, Pitt Cobbett, as a picture of a very young Pitt, was recruited as the foundation dean. And it was his vision in many ways um, to establish a program 
um, uh, that was forward looking for its time, um, including courses on international law. Um, right from the inception, uh, uh, Sydney had um, um, a DNA of, of looking forward. Um, it was also the first Australian law school to admit women. Uh, there's Ada Evans. Um, she was, in fact, the first um, LLB graduate um, uh, in the Commonwealth, uh, certainly the Commonwealth of Australia. And as we're um, doing investigations to see whether she was um, more broadly uh, one of the first pioneers in, um, in, in completing her law studies. Unfortunately, she was denied admission to the bar even though she was qualified um, um, by the Supreme Court for 17 years. Um, so uh, it's very important for us to, to acknowledge our, our pioneering um, um, uh, women of law, of Sydney law. Um, and uh, in fact, it was the efforts of the Senate, our governing body lobbying uh, the, um, parliament to change the law to allow women uh, to be admitted as legal practitioners. I think such an important history uh, and we'll be celebrating, as you can see, um, 120 years since her graduation next year. And we've got a whole range of wonderful uh, programs of activity to acknowledge that. Um, rankings are always important, you know, global reputations. Australia is relatively a small jurisdiction. Um, um, it's a big country, but it's a small jurisdiction. Uh, but we really do punch above our weight and uh, not only uh, does this law school rank in the top 20 um, of the world in, the, um, in, in, in these leading uh, rankings like the QS, um, but our graduates um, are really being trained for a, a career that can take them anywhere in the world. Um, that level of recognition um, and the uh, generations of law students that have gone before um, really are part of the, um, of the Sydney uh, Law School uh, legacy. Um, so rankings are one thing. Um, I also think it's really important to recognize the connection between scholarship, research and teaching. I uh, very strongly over the course of my 30 years have uh, uh, done both uh, and I feel there's a, a natural synergy. And that means that our, our students are being taught by their leaders in their field, not only nationally, but also globally. Um, and that network allows us to run courses. We have a range of summer winter uh, courses. Uh, of course, um, in a COVID uh, era, they're all um, um, being developed in uh, either on hold or being developed in different ways to accommodate the fact that people can't move about. But in the ordinary course of events, uh, the opportunity to undertake intensive study, um, um, a, a two week program in the Himalayas, in Berlin, in Oxford, in Shanghai, uh, these programs have been going on for, um, in, in one case, the uh, China uh, program has been going on for, for 20, more than 20 years. So we have a, um, a very wide, extensive global network which benefits our students. Um, our alumni are extraordinary. I mean, we have um, so many of our leading um, senior judges have passed through this law school. Um, and um, even the most recent um, announcement of the uh, New South Wales DPP um, um, is again another uh, another of our wonderful uh, uh, female graduates. Um, again, another pioneer, another um, uh, um, trailblazer, um, um, but follows in the legacy of many amazing people, including, of course, um, the governor of New South Wales, Margaret Beasley, who uh, has an amazing history uh, of support and engagement with law school. Uh, and in, in amongst doing her regal, vice regal responsibilities is also an honorary associate of our law school. So uh, we're very uh, fortunate by having such an amazing uh, network of alumni who are incredibly proud of their engagement um, with the uh, law school um, and continue to give back um, there are many um, um, areas of excellence, and I think uh, there are only a, a handful of um, law schools in, in Australia and the world that excel in mooting. Now, if you don't know what mooting is, that's fair enough. Um, it's a form of um, um, uh, legal debating is probably the best way. Um, these these um, uh, competitions have been global. 
Uh, the most famous is the Jessup uh, moot. It's an international law moot. Uh, and we have been number one, that's uh, more than 500, 600 uh, law schools in the world compete. And uh, every year two uh, law schools from Australia uh, go through and we have won it more times than pretty much anyone. And uh, that is an extraordinary record. And mooting is um, something that is done um, uh, really um, through the competitions programs of, of SALS. And I'm sure Wendy, the president of SALS, our student society will talk about that. The level of uh, support, commitment and engagement. And you don't, there are many different levels of mooting that you can engage in. So uh, if you were like me, you are morbidly fearful of public speaking uh, before you um, uh, come to a university, then there's um, very safe spaces in which you can learn uh, about uh, um, uh, uh, mooting and debating um, within the program. So um, I think the idea is really for me to give you a, a, a very short, I'll try and keep it short, mini lecture on, on what I suspect some of you may be wondering. Is there, ever, is there really going to be a career for me um, at the end of my law studies? Um, it's a big investment, time and energy and, um, and commitment. And are we all going to be replaced by robots, to put it in a, in a simple, simple way? Well, um, there is no doubt that we live in an age of digital transformation. And uh, I put up here a couple of forecasts that you know, we're, we're, we're developing extraordinary technology that can help identify um, and analyze uh, legal problems, um, to be able to sift through large quantities of, 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 of documentation. But once a junior lawyer would end up sitting in the basement with boxes and boxes of documents um, engaging in a discovery, as it's called, uh, that uh, can be uh, largely automated and be more accurate and you can see these transformations of technologies happening, the ability to access law online, um, the, the fact that increasingly legal proceedings are being conducted um, uh, remotely um, and uh, using technology. Um, and then of course, the prospect that artificial intelligence can uh, um, uh, assist in producing reasoned judgments uh, that apply the law to these facts. And this is a debate that actually has been going on uh, for 30 years. Um, and uh, I have a view that there is no doubt that technology will continue to um, augment uh, the nature of uh, legal practice. Um, and uh, certainly we're equipping our students with all the skills to navigate the technologies. But I don't think anytime soon there will be uh, the opportunity to replace lawyers and judges um, with artificial um, technology. And, and I'll explain in a while why that's the case. Um, the other forecast is really that tech, um, like all um, um, transformations, and they talk about it being the fourth um, in, um, industrial re revolution, a technology revolution uh, in the literature, um, the technology um, as it relates to law is going to bring about um, better access um, whereas once you would have to, if you wanted to know what the law was, you'd either have to hire a lawyer or um, try and find a law library that you could access. You'd have to physically go there. You'd have to look up the legislation. And of course, we know, uh, as, in, um, as in medicine, uh, you can access law through Google. Um, there's a lot of risk in being a bush lawyer, as we call it. Um, um, but there's no doubt there's a lot more accessibility to uh, legal information. Um, the profession itself has been very um, exercised by this and our New South Wales Law Society, that's the peak body of solicitors, has uh, published a paper, um, the future is the FLIP um, uh, report. Um, and, and what they identified um, um, in that report, now uh, five years old, uh, was uh, a, a higher degree of automation anxiety that there was a, a technology was posing a risk to a low level skills that are needed. And I talked about, you know, the young lawyers burying themselves in boxes of documents to try and find the, if you like, the smoking gun um, that, you know, that that can be rep replicated by um, algorithms that can search through 
large uh, quantities of, of documentation. And then at the high end, the ability uh, with artificial intelligence to, to really um, develop um, uh, legal arguments um, uh, that can be more persuasive, be structured in ways um, that uh, draw on a much wider range of legal sources. Um, so um, there's, there's concerns um, both at the junior and at the most senior uh, end that expertise um, um, might be um, challenged by technology. But I, I think really at the end, um, law and legal practice is much more than just being technically proficient in taking um, the rules as you discover them and applying them to the facts uh, as your clients present them. Um, there is no doubt there is a huge, what I call normative aspect. Um, there is an element in which um, law as a system of rules really is a little bit crude. Um, there's lots of scope uh, in the margins for uh, differing interpretations of the law. Um, one of our uh, professors, Julia Stone, who was the appointed uh, in, in 1946 and is one of the global figures in legal theory said, um, there is uh, leeways of choice in the way in which um, uh, judges adjudicate. And that's um, uh, really important to understand that within the fabric of law, um, there are going to be arguments and different perspectives. And that is how the law adapts and evolves. Uh, can we create algorithms that can simulate that? Uh, well, that's a, a question uh, that is uh, one that is uh, forefront in the mind of um, the scholars thinking about technology and law. But I do think that the ethical dimensions, the moral dimensions of laws um, are not easily uh, reduced uh, to an algorithm. Uh, and certainly that is the, uh, the viewpoint um, of, of many of those working within the system, that in the end, uh, the exercise of adjudication, of judging, uh, is, is concerned with um, moral principles and ethical principles, uh, how we understand fairness um, through, the, through the eyes of, of uh, the judges that kept excluding Ada Evans um, um, from being uh, a legal person under the statute that denied her legal um, um, access to the courts to become a lawyer. Um, our ideas of justice, fairness, uh, and equality change over time. And so I think that's one of the challenges, how you build into any technological system, those normative, um, uh, moral, uh, um, ethical, and, um, and social considerations. Uh, the other thing is I've been talking largely up to this point about um, lawyers as practitioners, but I have to say one of the most amazing things about a Sydney law degree, and many of our students, um, in fact, the majority have graduate outcomes where they um, immediately are employed. Um, in fact, we have very high levels of uh, uh, graduate employment. Um, um, there's a lot of competition out there, but our students uh, do um, um, have great success, but they, not everyone wants to pursue a career in, in the practice of law. And, and uh, certainly I pursued uh, my career in law reform in, in, in the UK for 35, 40 years ago when I um, uh, qualified, um, and that led me in a very different direction. And the, the ability to work in government, to work in corporations, to work in not-for-profits, our students um, do amazing things. Um, and I think it's important to recognise that the law degree, if you're, if you're doubtful about whether you want to be a lawyer, don't worry, a law degree is highly coveted uh, for careers in many, in many other ways. So I think, you know, we live in an uncertain world. We live in an uncertain age. COVID um, has magnified that, and I'm sure, and I really send um, my um, empathy to both the students in year 12 and their parents who are engaging in uh, what is euphemistically called homeschooling. Um, I send my uh, empathy and, uh, and, uh, uh, and I hope um, that uh, the current challenges do pass. Um, we, we, we are confronting lots of uncertainty about how we continue to deliver a, an outstanding uh, legal education, but we are committed um, to doing that um, through our mission, which is deeply connected with the principles that we teach, which is upholding law and justice. Um, 
you know, a commitment to the rule of law is a foundational principle, uh, a bit like the Hippocratic Oath in, 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 in the medical profession. We're also committed to rethinking and, and, and challenging and contesting law. Um, law like medicine doesn't stand still, and we're, we're constantly encouraging our students to ad ad um, adopt that um, questioning and challenging uh, approach. And, and to see their responsibilities, particularly in the social justice space, um, um, to ensure that we um, reach out and help um, disadvantaged communities and vulnerable communities who are facing injustice. So we do have a, a very strong commitment. Sydney Law School is probably not renowned for that, but we, we, we do have a history and a record um, of extraordinary achievement in the social justice space. Um, and uh, we, many of the um, leading human rights lawyers um, uh, in, in, um, in Australia and globally uh, have gone through Sydney Law School. Um, so we, we are very committed to the, the importance of the rule of law and promoting, in, in a sense, a values-based approach uh, to the way in which um, students are uh, educated. So uh, this is my final slide really is that, you know, it's not about just filling your head with legal facts, um, is actually um, uh, cultivating a whole range of um, what you could say are graduate attributes or generic skills. You learn how to argue uh, in, in a reasoned way. There's certainly a lot of argument in, in, in the culture in which we live. Not all of it is, um, um, is um, is reasoned. Um, so uh, problem solving, how we uh, essentially um, uh, tackle problems in different ways. And law is not always the beginning and end of a, of a, of a solution to a problem. Uh, evaluation, critical analysis, reasoning, decision making, as you'll see, thinking like a lawyer um, is, is will be uh, a part of that initial mission. But as you quickly learn, there are many different types of lawyers and many different types of arguments. Some are more or less persuasive um, in a particular context, but uh, you'll learn all of those uh, terrific skills, um, both in the classroom and in the co-curricular programs that uh, the law school with SALS, our amazing um, student society, uh, that is the oldest student society uh, in, in the university um, delivers for its students. So look, at that point, I'm gonna stop sharing I think that's a lovely segue over to Wendy, uh, our SALS president, and she can pick up the uh, story from here. Uh, and we'll come back to questions um, at the end. So um, thank you, um, and I'll hand over to Wendy. Great, thank you so much for that, Simon. Um, I'm also gonna quickly share my screen. Um, great. So uh, I am also coming today from um, Gaddy Country, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders um, past, present um, and emerging. Um, as Farah said, um, hi, everyone. My name is Wendy and I am the president of SOULS uh, for 2021. SOULS stands for the Sydney University uh, Law Society. Um, and we are essentially a faculty affiliated society. So anyone who studies law at UCID um, is essentially automatically eligible to be a member. Membership is free. Um, I encourage all of you, if you do decide um, to come and study here to join. As Simon mentioned, we are the oldest, largest and most active um, society um, at the University of Sydney. Um, to give you a bit of a sense of scale, um, I lead a 22 strong executive team. We're supported by um, a committee of 150 um, students and we have over 3000 members. Um, so we really do um, capture quite a large student body. Um, we run over 100 um, events each year, um, and even uh, in semester one, we've run over 70 events, and these are just some kind of cover photos um, and snapshots of the things that we've done already so far. Um, obviously, uh, there's a lot to cover, so what I thought uh, would be best is if I quickly ran through um, some of our uh, portfolios and highlighted the main programs initiatives that they run, um, and then, of course, I'll provide you with some further resources and links um, to have a 
dig a dig a little deeper to see um what we get up to on a day-to-day -day basis. Great. So the first portfolio I talk about is education. So the education portfolio um, raises kind of academic concerns with faculty, liaises with them to make sure that your academic experience is as suitable as possible. They also run a lot of um, study tips um, sessions and also creates peer support groups. So you can um, connect with other students and um, share study tips um, through that. Uh, the next portfolio is careers. Um, so the careers portfolio is really instrumental to showcasing the whole range of um, pathways out there. And as Simon mentioned, um, not uh, everyone decides to be uh, to become a lawyer um, and not everyone decides to do a clerkship or uh, be a corporate lawyer. And we really want to highlight um, all of those uh, different opportunities um, in the public sector, in not-for-profits, um, even in non-legal uh, industries. The careers program also runs a really successful um, mentoring program where we connect you with um, industry professionals. And this year we've also introduced um, an inter-cohort mentoring program where we connect uh, uh, younger students with older students and allow for tips to be shared um, in that way. Uh, the next portfolio then is social justice. Um, the social justice committee does really, really important work with uh, raising awareness um, around uh, social issues. Um, they run a lot of panels with distinguished guests from human rights to environmental law. They also run um, policy pitch competitions. Uh, this, uh, for example, in semester one, we had one on criminal law and um, sorry, on environmental law. And in semester two, we'll have one on criminal law. So this is a great way if you're interested in law reform um, to uh, flex your creative juices there. They also run a juvenile justice mentoring uh, scheme and also a refugee language tutoring program. So there are a lot of great ways to get involved there. We then have um, a treasurer and a secretary um, and they look after the day-to-day -day finances um, and also the governance of the society. Uh, we also have a sponsorship director who looks after um, that uh, kind of the back end of the society as well. And uh, this year we've really focused on trying to diversify um, the sponsors uh, that we engage in to help support all of the programs that we run. Um, probably what uh, you guys are all most interested in is our uh, socials program. Um, so uh, we have um, Law Camp, which is hugely popular with all of our first year LLB students. We run a welcome party. We run end of um, semester socials. Uh, we are even planning to have a law carnival this year. Um, and of course, um, Law Ball, which is probably the most coveted and exciting event of the year, um, where we're hoping to have over a thousand students um, come. Uh, this is obviously uh, COVID pending. So I think socials is definitely um, what makes our life at Sydney Uni um, so rich and fulfilling. And I've definitely made so many friends and met so many great people um, through attending all of our social events. Um, similar to that is our campus portfolio. They um, help form more social events uh, specific to your cohort. So if you're LLB1, helping you connect with other students in LLB1, you'll also have two cohort representatives who will um, help uh, speak out against any issues that you might be facing um, in your cohort. Um, the campus portfolio also looks after wellbeing week. Um, so obviously um, it's important that we um, talk about mental health and look after our mental health every day, um, but we also have a dedicated week each semester where we have dedicated programs um, to help um, um, talk more about um, the uh, issues that we're facing um, with mental health. Um, our sports uh, uh, committee and portfolio runs um, Interfac uh, Sport every Wednesday, which is a really great way um, to uh, start the week and meet uh, and play um, different uh, sports um, with other societies. Um, they also look after our merchandise. So we have an online store where you can purchase um, a lot of uh, Sydney University um, uh, gear. Um, we have a great publications um, portfolio. We have over 14 um, publications um, each year. We also have a blog called Citations and a podcast called Footnotes. So I'd really encourage you to um, check out those platforms and see what um, students are writing and speaking about. 
our international portfolio um, is really important uh, to help um, raise awareness um, and flag any issues that our international students are facing, which is particularly important with remote learning and a lot of our students um, being uh, not in Australia at the moment. Um, our equity uh, committee then looks after student welfare. We also run a textbook loans um, uh, scheme and a grant scheme, and also look after issues uh, surrounding disabilities. Uh, we then have a few autonomous portfolios, so a women's, a queer, an ethnocultural, and a First Nations portfolio. Um, and these are basically a first point of call for any students who um, identify with these portfolios um, to have uh, confidential um, and meaningful discussions and safe spaces um, uh, for students. And finally, we have a marketing and design portfolio who looks after our social media um, and makes sure that um, our branding is all on point. So I've um, definitely given all of you uh, a lot of information. Um, we, Souls basically covers all aspects of your student life um, from socials um, to competitions, to education, to careers, um, any, uh, thing that uh, you know you kind of want from your law degree um, there's definitely a program for you to get involved in and people who you can speak to so I'd really encourage all of you to check out our website um, our newsletter our Facebook page and our Instagram and um, yeah if you have any other questions feel free to contact us through that and um, we'll also answer questions at the end as well so thank you very much and I'll pass now to Peter. Good morning. I too would like to uh, 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 acknowledge country. I'm coming to you from Gadigal land this morning. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So now I'm going to talk to you about um, the pathways into studying law at Sydney. Uh, we'll look at the, uh, the three entry options and at each entry point, we'll look at the admission criteria and the structure of the degree. We'll then touch on briefly uh, how you become admitted to as a lawyer in New South Wales, we'll look at our employability rates, and we'll look briefly at our scholarships. So the first entry point for law into Sydney is the Bachelor of Laws, which you do, uh, you come into is from high school. Uh, there's five partner degrees, which you can see there, Arts Law, Commerce Law, Economics Law, Science Law, and Engineering Honours Law. They're all five year programs, except for Engineering Honours and Law, because Engineering, like Law, is a professional degree. Uh, so you're required to do an extra year to meet the professional requirements to become an engineer. All programs except arts require a, a band for and HSC maths advance. That's the part of the degree, not law. There's no requirements to study law. Now, entry from high school, it's a guaranteed ATAR of 99.5, or an IB equivalent of 43, and all applications are through UAC. Now, uh, for the LLB, there are a number of entry pathways that you can come into. Uh, there's the Broadway scheme, which is our equity access screen for university. And that's if you experienced significant serious advantage during years 11 and 12. There's the early offer year 12 scheme, which we call the year 12 scheme. And that's if you've experienced financial disruption in years 11 and 12 and or have attended a regional and remote high school and can demonstrate potential to, to succeed at the university. There's the elite athlete and performance scheme for those athletes and performers who are performing at the highest level. The future leaders scheme, uh, the school captains and ducks of high schools, and there's, then there's a Gadigal program for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. Uh, the law school does not participate in the academic excellence scheme. Now, if you come into the LLB or partner, with a partner degree from high school, it's a five year double degree. And the way it works is that the first year of law, which is eight years of study, is embedded in your partner degree. So basically, if you see that table you can see on the screen now, you're doing two, two law units in first year, three in second year. And three and third year, which is eight units, which is one year. And at the end of third year, you get your first degree, whether it's arts, commerce, economics, or science. In the case of engineering, you suspend your law studies at that point and do another year of engineering before you come into law in your fifth year. Years four and five uh, are the last two years of your LLB, so you're actually in the Bachelor of Laws at this stage. Uh, at the end of fourth year, you complete your compulsory units, and then your last year is your elective year. And that's when you get opportunity uh, in the world, if it's open to study offshore or go on exchange, uh, go into clinical units, um, participating in meeting programs and so on, there's quite a lot of things you can do in that final elective year. 
Now, if you don't get the ATAR from high school, you can apply for a transfer after first year of university at any university in any degree. Uh, the criteria changes to the better of with your ATAR, which remains at 99.5, or your first year of university. So if you get around the distinction average in your first year, you would be, uh, you'd be competitive in gaining a transfer place into law. If you're already at Sydney, uh, you might be doing a single degree or another com combined degree. Um, we have an internal transfer screen where you, where you would be assessed on your university and university results. Um, if you're in a partner degree like arts or commerce or economics or science or engineering, you would normally get credit for first year and still carry on and do um, finish your degree in five years. If you're, another, if you're at another university, we still will look at you again. Uh, you apply for UAC and you're assessed on your grade point average in that department degree. If you're doing a combined law program somewhere else, uh, it is possible to get credit for your law studies and this would be assessed once you get an offer. Now, if you're doing a single degree and you're coming in um, as, as an internal transfer student or transfer from a single degree to another university, we have a defined pathway for you. And this is the structure for years two and three. So you may recall in that first slide I showed you of, of the degree structure, you did two, two law units in the first year, then three and three in the subsequent years. If you come in as a transfer student from a single degree, you make up that, those two units you missed in first year by doing four units of law with your partner degree in second year and four units of law in your third year. You then go into fourth year of all law as you would have done otherwise. So if you do take a, the transfer option and get in, uh, you're basically in the same sort of degree pathway uh, after a few years. Now, if you don't get entry from high school or, or you don't get entry, entry from transfer, we have the Sydney Juris Doctor. Now, the Juris Doctor is a graduate entry law degree for graduates from other degrees. So you go, if you go off and do a degree in something else, it doesn't matter what it is, uh, and we get students from every degree you think of, music, medicine, engineering, arts, commerce, and so on. Uh, this is a graduate entry qualifying law degree. Uh, the admission criteria is different again, so it's uh, either the better of uh, a completed degree, it's your GPA for a completed degree, or it's a combination of 25% HSC and 75% grade point average for a completed degree. Now, if, if, uh, if you've got a high ATAR, uh, basically that boosts your chances of getting into this program. If you've done multiple degrees, uh, we use the best degree, and it's not unusual for students to have done multiple degrees coming into this program. Now, because the Juris Doctor is a, uh, a graduate entry degree, it's regarded as postgraduate, we have both Commonwealth supported places, which is what we have only for the LLB, so that's where the government partly su supports your studies. Um, because of JD's postgraduate, we have both Commonwealth supported places and we have full fee places. Uh, for a Commonwealth supported place, um, to give you a guide of what you may need to get in, you need a, um, a grade point average in the distinction range. Uh, and, and an ATAR in the 90s that would boost your opportunity, boost your chance to get in there. For a fee place, uh, you need around a credit average for entry uh, in an ATAR in the low 90s, even in the high 80s potentially. Now, just to make a point of differentiation here, for Commonwealth supported places and domestic fee places, the government does support you for Commonwealth supported places, and there's, there's opportunity for you to defer, the, uh, defer your fees. So it's relatively inexpensive compared to a full fee place where you're paying full fees and there's no support from the government. However, the government does give you opportunity uh, to defer that fee, uh, but they cap how much you can borrow, which you can pay down over time. So if you, if you are considering the JD, and that's for, your, for you in high school, it's probably a long way away. If you do consider the fee, fee option at that time, be mindful that uh, you may not be able to borrow the entire amount of money to complete the degree as a fee paying student. So they're the three entry points. Uh, so I should show the structure of the, of the uh, JD. So the first year of the JD is a discrete year. So that's exactly the same as the, as the, as the first year of the LLB across the three years of the partner degree. So because the JD is a discrete degree because you've already done your first degree, you just do it as a discrete first year. The second year is, is there a second year of compulsory units, which is the same as the fourth year uh, of the LLB. And the final year is the elective year, again, the same as the fifth year of the LLB. In years one and two, you're typically in your own classes. So the JD classes only, you're not interacting with students in the LLB. But in the final year, you are actually in the same classes with your LLB uh, cohort, your, your fellow cohorts. Um, so all the opportunities available to you, whether it's offshore study, exchange, clinical units, mooting, uh, and so on, are available to all cohorts of students. So now in terms of being uh, uh, admitted to practice, uh, the profession, both in terms of uh, 
employability uh, in recruitment and, uh, and admission is exactly the same for LLB students and the Jewish doctor students. So if you're being admitted to practice in New South Wales and the way degrees are, uh, are, are designed, we have to satisfy the requirements in the jurisdiction in which we teach. And for us, that's in New South Wales. So it's a state-based system in, in Australia. Uh, so you have to uh, complete an LLB or a JD, you then do practical legal training. Uh, for us, most of our students will probably do that um, either through the College of Law or do it uh, in-house with, with a law firm. You then apply to the Supreme Court of New South Wales to be admitted to practice. And most students, or most students at this stage would then uh, go on to, be, uh, to join the Law Society and become a solicitor and get a practice certificate. And after some years, they may consider becoming a barrister, which, which has additional um, requirements to become, uh, to, to join. And that's a uh, bar exam through the Bar Association. Now, um, as I said, our degree satisfies the requirements to practice in New South Wales. Uh, upon admission, you are eligible uh, to practice in other Australian states and territories, either directly or through the mutual recognition scheme, and that also includes New Zealand. Uh, now, the LLB and the JD uh, can also be used to uh, be admitted to practice in many other countries. Uh, typically, most common law countries would, our accept, would accept our degree, uh, but typically you've got additional hoops to jump through to be admitted. So uh, if, if in the long term you are considering uh, an international career, and many of our students do go into practice, uh, for example, we hosted a Hong Kong uh, law careers panel last week with, with uh, four of our Hong Kong alumni telling students of the opportunities to, to work there. Uh, there are additional requirements, as I said, and you need to go investigate what they are before you can go off and, and practice in those other jurisdictions. Now our employability rates, uh, we mentioned those earlier, we have st strong employability rates. Uh, our graduates are typically working full time at the completion of the degree at 82% uh, compared to the 78% average for the university and 71% uh, national average. Now, I'll just touch briefly, uh, briefly on scholarships. Uh, for Year 12 students, the university has a wide range of scholarships, and many of you may have already explored these. Uh, so I won't go into them in any great detail other than to say you need to have Sydney as your first preference and ATAR uh, above 95 and applications close on the 3rd of September. Now, the law school itself for undergraduate students, the LLB, has a range of equity scholarships. Uh, the Abu Scholarship and the Victorian Golan Memorial Scholarship are for Indigenous students, and so that would be those students applying to the Gadigal scheme. The other scholarships are also equity scholarships, and they're typically based around financial, uh, financial disadvantage, and uh, one of them has a remote and regional requirement. Now, for the JD, we have uh, law-specific scholarships. We have both equity scholarships, which is the Longworth Scholarship, and the Golden Scholarship, again, which is for Indigenous students, and the Coghlan Little John Scholarship and the Wigan Allen Scholarship uh, for domestic students, or they can be international students, but mainly domestic students uh, get those scholarships. And that's, that's a, that's a, they support you across the three years of the JD program. And there's also a, a Dean's International Law Scholarship. So that's uh, my part for, for this talk this morning. Thank you very much. It's now question time. So I'll hand you back to, uh, to Simon to lead uh, any questions that people might have. Um, thank you, Peter. Thank you, uh, thank you Wendy. Um, um, as you can see, um, the Q&A, if you have clicked onto it, is um, I think the technical expression is gone off. Um, certainly there are lots and lots of questions um, and um, I've been on there um, uh, uh, along with some of our, um, our student um, um, uh, support uh, uh, colleagues and uh, trying to give um, um, some advice uh, fairly quickly but there, look there's a lot of uh, a lot of similar questions um, and so um, you, if you can you can scroll through some of the answers there but um, um, uh, uh, Ferris, Sam, uh, I think at this point we'll just um, open um, open the floor. Do we do we pick questions from those that have come through? Um, certainly, I can I can address some of them that I've seen yeah. in general because there's there's a few that that have some constant themes. One of them was you know um, uh, was that anxiety about is there going to be a law job for me at the end? And there is a a, a glut of um, uh, law graduates. When I arrived in Australia 30 years ago, there were, there were really 10, 10 um, law schools. There's now over 40. Um, so that's a, a, and they've all become much, much, much larger, including Sydney. But um, we are, relatively speaking, a small 
uh, law school um, um, as the um, uh, relative to some of the other um, uh, newer universities. Um, where does that put us in terms of graduate outcomes? I noticed that Ferris put, um, put up a statistic saying that we're, uh, we have 82 percent um, graduate employment. The, the data that I've seen, and I don't want to engage in uh, false representation, is actually over 100 um, because our students are in, in some of the um, 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 surveys, the, the survey looks at em employment and further study, uh, and some of them are doing both. Um, so you end up with over 100%. I think the point is, is that students um, at Sydney um, are at the, um, have lots of inbuilt advantages, uh, being part of the group of eight, which is the eight top uh, research intensive universities. It's a well-established program. Um, uh, there's um, a lot of engagement with the uh, professions um, um, and many of our alumni are in, in the, uh, obviously in senior positions. So I think in terms of visibility, our students have a lot of inbuilt advantage. Um, um, and I think that um, plays out with um, pretty, um, pretty good outcomes. It does become, uh, nevertheless, having said all of that, anxiety kicks in as Wendy would well know, will I get a job? Um, you know, this, it's so competitive. There's, you know, uh, 400 people chasing one graduate uh, clerkship, but um, there are many pathways into a legal career and if you talk to the recruiters uh, not only in the profession but also in government um, um, there are many ways in which you can commence your um, uh, legal career or non-legal career and and I think there was also an implication is it true that law students are highly valued in in other uh, professional vocational choices the answer is yes they really are they are um, because of course particularly if you've done um, the LLB program, you've also done probably honours in your other degree. And so you come out with this amazing uh, nexus of, of, say, it's um, economics and law, and you'll end up working in the Australian competition and consumer, uh, um, you know, um, Australian corporate and consumer uh, commission, you know, the ACCC, or you'll end up doing policy uh, that allows you to, to draw on your social science or your psychology and law. There's so many amazing uh, niches where your law degree will come really um, handy. So I think um, uh, it, it, in a sense, we, we tend to focus on um, legal practice as a barrister or a solicitor as, as first destination, but our, our, our students go and do many, many things. Many become associates of judges. Uh, again, it's a another well-established pathway. They, they end up um, being a, an associate, a tip staff um, um, for, for, for a judge. And again, our students um, uh, are well represented in both state and federal um, 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 choices of judges um, for those very coveted positions. Um, so that, that, was, uh, that was one of the questions that I saw coming through. I don't know, uh, Peter or Wendy, if you, if you can, uh, have a look at the, um, uh, or Sam, if you've got any questions that you'd like to um, share. Um. Um, yeah, I kind of wanted to build on that point um, and say that personally, um, I'm very interested in public policy um, and don't see myself practicing um, as a solicitor per se, but I think the law degree has really um, given me such a diverse um, skill set and made me very interested in um, domestic pol public policy issues. So that's kind of the career path um, that I'm looking at. And I know a lot of friends who are in very similar um, positions. I'd also say that I think Souls provides a lot of great career resources. We have excellent mentoring schemes, skills, workshops, and um, panels where we allow you to connect with practitioners um, and professionals in a whole uh, suite um, of industries. And I think there are a couple of questions as well around culture. Um, again, from a personal experience, I was the only one from my school who actually came to Sydney Law School. So that was a very daunting experience for me. Um, but what I found is that people are so welcoming, so willing to, um, you know, engage in conversation, um, share experiences, um, you know, 
those late nights in the library, especially are great times um, to bond with others in your class. And I think through um, Souls and through all of the other um, law school programs, um, I've really developed such a, a close um, group of friends and met such wonderful people. And I think speaking to a lot of students, whether from interstate, um, whether from overseas, that's really been the experience that they've shared with me as well. So um, yeah, I think the culture has been nothing but fantastic. So look, I've worked in, um, in, in several universities over the 32 years. Um, I was 20 years at ANU. Um, I worked in Hong Kong for a couple of years in the late 90s. And then I was in Queensland uh, for 10. Um, I think the, uh, the key point about not all universities are the same. That's one thing I learned early, early on. One thing that's really obvious to me is that um, Sydney um, uh, University is not a commuter campus. Um, it, it's actually, uh, from my perspective, when I say not a commuter campus, of course, people commute to it uh, when it's open. Um, but, but, but students come to, to university, they're busy and they've got work outside and they're, 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 maybe they're working in a law firm as a clerk, but they really do enjoy coming and um, uh, um, studying on campus. Um, and uh, and that, that's reflected in the really active social activities and um, educational activities that our students do, much more so, I have to say, than anywhere else uh, that I've worked. Uh, and that's a real uh, tribute to, to Sulls. Um, and, and these are your future peers. You know, I think that's the other thing is that, um, you know, you really get to know these people. Uh, it is tough. I mean, I, I, you know, I can't, you can't sugarcoat that. You know, you're dealing with an extraordinarily able cohort um, and the expectations of the teachers are, are, are high and, and students inevitably have a period of adjustment um, because they're now working in an environment where everyone is really at the top of the, top of the game uh, educationally. Um, and there are some that seemingly are um, perfectly uh, adept at law from day one and are, are nailing it. Um, like many, for me, it actually took a while and getting my first passes in in my first year was was quite traumatic. And I think many uh, academics and many students um, have that period of adjustment. But you do have an amazing cohort of of students that I think um, will become lifelong uh, uh, friends, peers, and part of that uh, amazing uh, global network. I mean, we were just last week hosting um, a, a student focused event where we drew together our Hong Kong based. Uh, alumni um, for the, the um, um, over you know a thirty year period of of students um, um, really to to give students a, a window into um, um, practicing in in different jurisdictions and um, um, and really demonstrating how incredibly global um, uh, Sydney Law School is um, yeah yeah th thank you very much, uh, Simon. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to also uh, thank Peter and Wendy as well. It, it's been really very informative uh, uh, session. So uh, for our attendees, we do uh, sincerely apologize. We couldn't really get through all the questions, but you're more than welcome to our law uh, course advice uh, Zoom, where you'll get a chance to speak to colleagues from the law school and get your questions answered as well. Thank you very much, Professor Burnett. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Wendy. And for our uh, attendees, please join us in the course advice Zoom and we wish you uh, all the best in your studies and we look forward to welcoming you to the University of Sydney Law School next year. Thank you.